This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the Advent King, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our messages during the Advent season, all the way up to December 24th, are going to be focused on the book of Micah. What do you remember about Micah? For even the most regular Bible reader, I don't know if the book of Micah is one that springs to mind quickly. What do you remember about the book of Micah? Micah is one of those 12 minor prophets. And they're not minor because the message in them is minor or less important. The message is very important, but they're shorter books. Being shorter, their volume that they take up in the Old Testament, right, right in the middle of your Bible, is pretty small. So I don't know the last time in your Bible reading that your eyes have gone through that section of the minor prophets. Since our messages and December are going to be focused on the book of Micah, it would be good to know the background of where these verses came from and the context in which they were said during a very dark, dark time. Here, here are a few facts. Micah prophesied about 740 B.C. Do you remember the two momentous events that were looming for God's people in the near future at about 740 B.C.? There were two exiles that were coming. What had happened was in the Old Testament, God's people had fallen away. After the time of King David, about 1000 B.C., his son, King Solomon, he was a wise man, but eventually the, the women and the pleasures and the work of this world turned his head and he introduced other gods even into the country for worship. After King Solomon, there was a civil war. Solomon's son took the two tribes to the south in the southern kingdom and another king took ten tribes to the north in the northern kingdom. They would have two separate kingdoms for the rest of their Old Testament history. Things did not go well. They had corrupt kings, idolatrous kings. One of them married a queen, Phoenician queen named Jezebel who imported her gods from her country. Things went from bad to worse. And there, there were some good kings along the way, but it was a sad history overall. And so eventually, story be told, God was going to exile his people. That would happen in 722 for the north, 20 years after Micah began his ministry, and 586 by the Babylonians for the south. Therefore, you can imagine the mood of Micah's book. Law, doom, gloom, condemnation, strong words that Micah has. And if you do a read-through of the book of Micah a couple times in December, you're going to find some dark, dark words that are tough reading at times. But there's a pattern. There's a pattern you have to know as, as we begin our look at Micah today. The pattern is this. There will be about two chapters of dark condemnation, strong words of law, and then all of a sudden there's a burst, like a flashlight, two, three, four verses of beautiful gospel promises, almost like a diamond that you put on a black velvet at the jeweler's. Beautiful gospel words. We're going to look at those gospel bursts, five of them, in the book of Micah this Advent season. Almost like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of book back and forth. So here's the first one today. After saying that he is coming, and that he is coming with the mountains melting and with the valleys splitting apart like wax. After the Lord says he is coming to break the idols and to make worship places for them into rubble. After saying he is going to weep and wail because of what has happened to his people, and that he's going to go about mourning, barefoot and naked. The Lord says that. After the Lord says that his own people should shave their heads in grief, and mourning because their children are going to be captured and going off into exile. After saying he is planning a disaster for them that they cannot save themselves from and that it is of their own making for two chapters, then the Lord says this. He says, I will surely gather you, all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock 
in, a past, in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them. The Lord at their head. Let's learn three brief things from this first mighty message of, of Micah. The first thing we see in verse 12 I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in the pasture. As you think about that assembling that God says he's going to do again after the exiles, think about the devastation that the exiles would cause. Their cities would be torched. Their lives would be over as far as they knew it. Many of them would die as their cities were besieged and overrun. Others of them would be captured and taken off as slaves, as captives, deported to all ends of the earth, some of them never to return. It would be devastating on their nation. Can you see the comfort that they would hear in this gospel burst that comes from Micah? I will gather you like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture, and the place will throng with people. Not only would they just be gathered, but they'd be thronging. There'd be an excitement there, happiness to be back in the, the pen with God's people. Do you see the first comforting thing we see from Micah this Advent season? What do these words mean for us? After all, when, when would these words be fulfilled? Do you know? They weren't fulfilled in the Old Testament. There would be a sad, pathetic remnant that would return to the southern kingdom. After all, the Savior still had to come. The ten tribes of the north... They never came back. They're called the lost tribes. The best and the strongest and the brightest of the south would not come back either. They would stay in Babylon or be gone forever. When would this be fulfilled? There are some Christians who, who hold out hope that this is a political promise. They call it Zionism, where the nation of Israel is going to rise to be politically prominent in the world again. Maybe God will bring about a, like a mass Christian conversion of the whole Jewish nation at the end of time and force them to believe in, in Christ. The false hope. No Zionism. What does this mean? In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote this, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who are God's people? Who are his sheep? Who are his Israel? Who are his children? who are Abraham's children. You are Abraham's children. This is nothing else than a promise in the messianic era that God is going to gather his people. This is nothing else than a New Testament gathering of the church, even the Gentiles coming into the church, who would be God's people. The Messiah would change this and it would be a worldwide kingdom. Oh, it's going to be the church militant and it will struggle on. But it's going to be a victorious church behind the banner of Christ. This is welcome news for us because we can say even in our lives that we were scattered. How have you been scattered? How have you been exiled? In Isaiah, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How have you personally been scattered? What paths have you walked down? What places have you gone? What forbidden sins have you done? Where have you gone where you deserve to be exiled away from the presence of God forever? Only you can search your heart and know that. But here, what does it say for sinners? What does it say for those who are scattered for wayward sheep? I will gather you. Through the Messiah coming, through the Advent King, God would fix our problem and he would gather his people. And what a New Testament similarity we see to this in the Good Shepherd. I will gather them. There'll be one flock. There'll be one shepherd. I am the gate. They'll come in. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. God will gather his people. What a welcome message this is for you and for me this Advent. There's a second lesson that we learn here as well. In verse 13 at the beginning it said, <clears throat> The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. This is a very unique picture here. So the sheep are in the pen. The sheep are hemmed in. They're confined, restricted. They're, they're there. They're safe. But they have to get out. 
And then it says there's one who's going to arise from their number and he's going to break open a way and he'll go up before them. And they're going to stream out of that place where they were confined after him. We, we could call this the ram, I guess. The battering ram. The older King James Version actually gives this an, a name here. It calls him the breaker. The breaker will go up before them and, and break out. And the word for break is a very violent word. It's a military word. It means to smash. It's a, a word of catastrophe. Very, very strong, strong word. This is our Advent King who is going to break you out. After all, what hemmed you in? What confined you? What chained you? Where have you been enclosed? Do you see the picture? There, there's a Lenten hymn that says, Enslaved by sin and bound in chains, beneath its dreadful tyrant's sway, and doomed to everlasting pains, we wretched guilty captives lay. Enslaved by sin and bound in chains. We have been hemmed in. We have been captured by our guilt and by our sin. What sin has addicted you? What pet sins do you keep going back to? What sins can you not shake? What, what temptations of the devil just seem to grab you by the tail and control you? What addictive sins, consistent paths have you gone down once again that have enslaved you? Well, you have a breaker. You have a battering ram. You have one who's going to break you out of that jail and who's going to, who's going to make you free. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the devil comes and he has that guilt before you and accuses you again, how could God forgive you? How could God love you? You did it again. You can't have forgiveness. The breaker breaks open the way by his death on the cross, by his victorious resurrection on Easter day, and by the gospel message that you have a place in heaven because of what he has done. Therefore, it's no surprise that one of our Easter hymns, Awake My Heart with Gladness, has this verse. He rends death's iron chain. He breaks through sin and pain. He shatters hell's dark thrall. I follow him through all. One more lesson for us in these verses. So we have a shepherd who's going to gather and assemble his sheep once again, you exiles. And he's also going to break them out from their confinement. What else will he do? The end of our, our text said this. The king will pass through before them the Lord at their head. The king will lead them. The king will be present. He's not going to break them out and disappear. He, he's not going to be like Superman. You know what Superman does. Superman comes in, saves the day. Off he goes. People are going, who, who was that person? Or the Lone Ranger, if you remember back even farther. Who was that masked man? Who, don't know. Not, not this Savior. Not this Messiah. He is the one who will stay with his people and he will lead them through life. He will lead them at the head. This is a very comforting picture. I, I think of the, the uh, exodus from Egypt where God broke them out of Egypt. Remember the Red Sea incident and the, the catastrophe with the Egyptian army, but they were safe. How did God lead his people through the wilderness? A pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud. That's how he led. Can you imagine how comforting that was for God's people in the desert? Could you imagine one morning if they woke up and the pillar of cloud was not there that day? And Moses says, you know, we're, we're going to be on our own today, but I'll get you through here. I, I, I think I'll find the way, but the Lord, he has some other things to do today. That would have been rather disconcerting. Can you imagine in your life if the Lord would say to you, send you a memo, an email, a text, whatever, and he would say, I'm rather busy today. I won't be able to watch you on the highway. I won't be able to be with you at work. I won't be able to save you from crime. I won't be able to do this for you. As far as your life and your health and your breath and everything else, I'll be back tomorrow. 
Boy, that would be a fearful, fearful feeling. The Lord is at our head. The Lord is present with us. Jesus said to his followers before he left, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Moses recognized how important that was in, in that wilderness. Did you know there was a time where the Lord had threatened to send someone else to lead them? After the golden calf incident, the Lord told Moses, I'm, I'm going to let my angel lead you, but I'm not going to be there. And it says this, The Lord said, I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. Go with us. Lead us. Be in us. Motivate us. Protect us. This is the Advent King who has promises to you about those very things. So that's our first mighty message today from Micah. And what comforting things we, we see here. God will assemble his people. Assemble the people even though they have been exiled by their sin and guilt. The Lord will break them out. The Lord will forgive them and save them. And the Lord will continue to lead them through their life. May these comforting words give you peace today in this first message from Micah. And I pray that God would bless our series as we continue to look at this book that gives us such comforting things to say during Advent. Amen. Please rise.